Good evening and welcome to the world today. In this State of the World Lecture, I'm going to be discussing the situation in Burma or Myanmar, where there are massacres taking place once again, the victims being the Muslim Rohingya population of that country. We'll be discussing also the situation in the northern half of the Korean Peninsula, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, as it uh, calls itself, and their recent verbal bouts with the United States of America, where Donald Trump has said that he could wipe them out. And thirdly, the new Cold War that is now proceeding apace between the United States and its uh, various uh, intelligence organizations and Putin's Russia. We are in September 2017, decades after globalization, decades after talk of the peace dividend, decades after promises that the world would be a much better place after the 1990s and the Cold War period. Yet, in reality, what we have witnessed since the end of the Cold War and the dissolution collapse of the Soviet Union is more wars, more use of the North Atlantic uh, Treaty organizations, more local conflicts, often fueled by big powers, etc. Let's start with what is going on in Myanmar. For many years now, the military in Burma, as it was then, took the country over from elected politicians in 1962 and imposed an incredibly rigid definition of nationality, ethnicity, religion. From the very beginning, the military government declared that they were the people who would determine the ethnicity and religion of various people living and whether they qualified as national races, i.e. members of the Burmese or Myanmar community of nationalities, part and parcel of that state. This had never been an issue before. In fact, in that part of the world, the whole concept of ethnicity was very fluid because Burma was never a unified nation. It was a loose gathering, sometimes not even a gathering, collection of independent states who were united together but not centrally. And in this period, there was a lot of movement of populations as there was in many other parts of the world. It was when Burma became a part of the British Empire, beginning in 1823 and carrying on till the 1830s when the British occupied the whole country, that the British Empire and its administrators did what they normally do when they rule a country, define very sharply the ethnic differences between people, declare which races are military races, which are non-military races, A, to create divisions, and B, to create an army which they can trust. Often the minorities comprise uh, groupings that are characterized as military races. The nationality and ethnicity of the people who inhabited Burma, which included, of course, a large majority of Buddhists and a minority of Muslims and some Catholics dating back to the Portuguese uh, uh, empire's uh, moves in that direction many years ago. Nobody was characterized simply as a Muslim or a Buddhist. It was the ethnicity, and that ethnicity was in those days, late 19th century, 
an ethnicity that tied these people to the small states that existed. The state of Arakan, the most western state of the Burmese region, was one which was separated from the center of Burma by a whole mountain range. Communications were difficult, travel was difficult, intermarriages were difficult, and so most of the people who lived in Arakan uh, intermingled much more closely with parts of what is now Bangladesh, but in those days was uh, United Bengal. So the links between Arakan and Bengal were much closer in terms of labor, in terms of trade, than they were with the central part of Burma itself. One has to go back a long way because all these issues are currently being discussed as if they were happening now uh, in order to drive the Rohingya population of Muslims from Arakan out of the country altogether. There are one million Rohingya people who live in uh, the province of Arakan in Myanmar today. From 1948, when Burma became independent, the Rohingyas were classified as Rohingyas and treated as citizens of the state. It was the military regime which trying to create a nationality, a rigid nationality of those who were Burmese and those who were non-Burmese, basically began the process which led in the 1980s to deny the Rohingyan people their rights on every level and to create effectively an apartheid system inside the country. So the Rohingyas were deprived of their nationality, and they were basically described as Bengalis. In other words, the implication being that they were Bengali migrants, immigrants from Bengal. The, the, the attack on the Rohingya population that we are witnessing has very little to do with what they actually do in Arakan. It is basically an attempt by the regime to shore itself up, to create a stronger nationalistic image for itself in a part of the world where nationalism as such never played a big part in the country's political life at all, which is why the Rohingyas were characterized as non-Burmese, non-Myanmaris, only after 1988 or 1989, as late as that. Today, many of them live in concentration camps, and of course, the constant persecution to which they've been subjected, not just by the state, but by their fellow inhabitants of the region, stoked by the state, has made life for them incredibly miserable. And as happens in such cases, minorities within oppressed communities take up arms and says enough of just sitting by and not doing anything and respond in kind. So I think the number of state casualties are about 20 maximum and the number of Rohingyas killed now or rendered homeless number tens of thousands. So how is this going to be sorted out? There is now a flow of refugees from Western Burma or Myanmar into Bangladesh. Ironically enough, when Bangladesh and Bengalis were fighting for their independence, most of the Rohingya leaders supported those who were trying to oppress them from Western Pakistan, as it was then, and the West Pakistani military. So there is no love lost between the Rohingya leadership and the Bangladesh government, uh, which inherited the mantle of those who had fought for independence. Nonetheless, the government is under some pressure to let as many as they can afford to take into the country, but the situation is miserable. And uh, the reason for this 
misery lie in the fact that ethnicity has become the main question in that country. There is no debate about it. In 2015, there was an election where the National League of Democracy, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, a leader who had already been given the Nobel Peace Prize <clears throat> for her moral and political attributes, became prime minister of the country after her party won a majority. This is the first genuine election ever since the military had come to power in 1962. There were tensions between the army and uh, Shu Chi's party, but on the question of the Rohingyas, she was at one with the military. And this deeply shocked many of her supporters abroad who couldn't understand how someone who had received the Nobel Peace Prize could behave in such a way, but at least at the time they gave her the prize, she hadn't committed any atrocities. But now her hands are not clean blood flows through them, and it is the blood of the Rohingya population. She has not made a single attempt to negotiate, to discuss with the leaders of this uh, tiny embattled community, to try and reach a compromise, and the reason is not simply that she, the army is preventing her, though obviously that plays a part, it's that she has no particular desire to do so. On previous occasions, when she's clashed with the army, she's made it very clear, either herself or through intermediaries in the West, saying how unhappy she is. On the question of the Rohingyas, she hasn't. And a deep Islamophobia now pervades the country. There is no other way of describing it. That is the situation as we see it in Myanmar. How could it be resolved? not by any external intervention. That is always a disaster. Nor is it the case, as the Burmese Myanmarian state uh, chauvinists allege, that there is a worldwide Islamic conspiracy where money is being poured in by every Muslim state under the sun to arm the Rohingyas, and the reason for this, why they might be doing this, is to make forcibly convert every Buddhist in Myanmar to become a Muslim and transform Burma into a Muslim country. So this notion that there's somehow an Islamist conspiracy uh, against Burma is a weak and pathetic response to those who argue that what the Burmese state is doing is unacceptable. On the other side, it has to be said that there can be exaggerations too. It is not the case that all the rulers of the Arakan region where this is happening now were Muslims. They were Buddhists, they were Hindus, they were a mixture of the two, they were syncretic, they were not Muslims. They often use Muslim language because of the closeness to Islamic or Islam and its culture in neighboring Bengal. But the two narratives often exaggerate beyond any uh, 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 rationale the past of the country, and that is always what happens in these clashes and ethnic cleansings and civil wars that take place. So they, should, they too need to get themselves under control. If the main aim is, and that's what it should be, is to get back for the Rohingya people the rights they once enjoyed after Burma became independent from 1948 to 1961, then the way is to discuss openly and publicly as to what constitutes the nationality of this state today and why all this is happening, in which historical discussion, of course, will come up. But that is the way to move forward, to try and de-ethnicize citizenship, to say that everyone who lives in the country is an equal citizen of the state, regardless of religion and regardless of ethnic origin or whatever. So <clears throat> something like that needs to be done. It could have been done if Aung San 
Xu Qi, the current civilian leader in alliance with the Myanmar military running the country, had insisted in public that this was the only way forward. But in fact, uh, she didn't, and the result is, uh, is, is what we see. At the moment, I have to admit, it's looking extremely difficult. If we move now further south from uh, Burma, we see another crisis that has hotted up uh, in recent weeks and months, and that is the crisis of North Korea and the fact that they have nuclear weapons and that they've been testing missiles, that they've just tested a hydrogen bomb. And uh, Kim Jong-un, the uh, leader of North Korea, has threatened to bomb American bases in Guam uh, and has made other threats which are largely empty, in my opinion. Why has he done this? Because, you know, one easy way <clears throat> of uh, dealing with the situation is to say Kim Jong-un is mad. I mean, to understand why every North Korean regime, admittedly under the Kims, Kim the first, Kim the second, and now Kim the third, uh, have been extremely hostile to the United States and the West, it's for good reason that the Korean War of 1950 to 53 was a brutal, vicious war in which chemical weapons and germ warfare was used against the North Korean armies. I remember when I visited North Korea the first time in the early 1970s, and as I was traveling around the country either by car or by train, my interpreter in chief of protocol would tell me, do you realize something, that the entire country was destroyed? I said I was aware of that. They said, but were you aware of the fact that when we say that, we don't just mean factories or military installations, we mean every single house. Our people were living in caves or in tents. We had to rebuild the country from scratch once again. And then you notice, when someone tells you a thing like that, you become extremely alert. There was, n and, and you notice it because there's no old part of Pyongyang at all, or any of the other cities. In North Korea, all the architecture I saw, and at first I was stunned till it was explained to me, was relatively new. But the cities I was in, they reminded me of Eastern European cities or some Russian cities rebuilt after the Second World War. And I'd said, that's why. I said, you could have found better architects. And they said, that was not our main priority. We had to get the buildings up quick. And clearly, the Russians and you know, the Chinese helped them to do so. <clears throat> but the entire country was destroyed. Since then, uh, North Korea has been under siege. It's in uh, the United States uh, basically sanctioned it. It can't trade with uh, many countries. Uh, it's not recognized by many countries, etc. Add to that that there is a large US military base in South Korea with tens of thousands of American soldiers. But the main question is why did North Korea decide to get nuclear weapons? Now, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which many countries have signed, was never signed by a number of countries, um, North Korea included. And some of these countries who go for nuclear weapons see it as the only way of protecting themselves against the United States. That's the honest truth. During the Iraq War, many supporters of Saddam Iraqis, then in fleeing in exile, said to me, if we had had weapons of mass destruction, the Americans would never have attacked us because we could respond. And this is, of course, the logic of the North Koreans saying it's a self-protection. The fact that uh, 
Kim Jong-un boasts about it and threatens the American, no one takes too seriously. He and his father have been doing it for ages. They were ignored by Bush Jr., by Bush Sr., by Clinton. Clinton actually tried to uh, get some movement towards unifying Korea, etc. But none of this went forward. And under the uh, Obama regime and now Trump, all attempts to negotiate with them to have a more conciliatory attitude were stopped. And this has nothing to do with the character of the regime or its absurdities. It has everything to do with the preservation of US hegemony in the region. Because they are fearful of unity because they feel, rightly from their point of view, that if Korea was united, it would be a nuclear power. If Korea was a nuclear power, it would be very difficult to get Japan to agree to remain non-nuclear. Hiroshima and Nagasaki don't feature prominently in the mindset of the Japanese rulers today. If Japan and the Korean Peninsula and China are key nuclear powers in that region, it shifts the balance of power globally and weakens the United States. So they are determined to stop it. Now, many people who, for very honorable reasons, oppose the spread of nuclear weapons, as I have done for most of my life, have to understand that there is this other aspect to it. People see it as the only form of self-protection. And given that the Koreans, the North Koreans, are permanently surrounded by the United States Navy, nuclear submarines, nuclear warships, American base in South Korea, they genuinely felt threatened, especially as their country was once destroyed. So there is no military solution to this crisis whatsoever. Apart from anything else, if the North Koreans were attacked, the first thing they would do without even using nukes would be to destroy the US military base in South Korea. They have the capacity to do that. Then what? Is anyone going to use nuclear weapons against them? Uh, that will infect, affect, pollute the entire peninsula and beyond. So it's crazy to talk about nuclear conflict and nuclear war. Whoever does it, whether it's uh, uh, Donald Trump or Kim Jong-un, there has to be another solution. Now, I mean, one of the powers in the region which could play the role of a mediator is China, upon which Korea depends for trade and many other things. The regions in North Korea, which are really <coughs> expanding industrially, improving the conditions of life for ordinary people, are the provinces which border China. A lot of trade flows, official and unofficial. And recently, the North Korean regime opened up the country saying that Small farms can be independent, can produce their own food, some shops, etc. It's a regime that is relaxing economically, but very rigid politically. And the reasons for the rigidity do not simply lie inside North Korea, but also outside it. So when the Chinese tell them to go easy, perhaps disarm, they get very upset. Uh, and the people who are supposed to be too pro-Chinese within the North Korean leadership have been eliminated. I mean, a few years ago, to everyone's surprise, Kim Jong-un had his aunt, his father's sister, and her husband arrested and executed after a short summary trial. And everyone went crazy. I mean, what's going on? This is never... But the reason for that, we now know, was very straightforward, is that he had got information and evidence that his aunt was actually working very closely with the Chinese. And the aim of the Chinese is to normalize North Korea. 
which is not a bad aim, but it's not an aim that can be fulfilled by ignoring the bulk of the leadership. Kim Jong-un is paranoid that unless a rigid grip is maintained, the Chinese will effectively use the North Korean army to dump him and his family and establish a regime uh, which is more or less the same in character, but uh, very much under Chinese uh, domination. This he is opposing strongly, though the principal enemy, of course, remains uh, the United States. So the fact that the United States is now under an unpredictable leader uh, doesn't make things easier because Trump can say one thing but not do it, which in this case is very positive. But the things he says are blood curdling. But the signs at the moment in relation to Korea are not good, though I personally doubt very much whether there is going to be any war as such. I mean, I don't think the United States has gone crazy that it's going to launch a military attack, nuclear or non-nuclear, against the Koreans. It would really have very serious consequences for their relations with uh, China, both as trading partner and as a major power now uh, in the world at large. So it has to be followed, but what it does do is create instability. It creates a mood of fear and people begin to, to worry. I mean, I was reading <clears throat> the other day a commentator who said that Britain would be threatened by the Korean nuclear weapons. You just have to start to laugh at that. I mean, we heard the, you know, it would be 45 minutes before the Iraqis launch their weapons of mass destruction and hit Britain, a lie that Blair used to drag this country into war. So propaganda of this sort inside the Western world doesn't help at all because we are already seeing the signs of an absurd, irrational Cold War against the Russians beginning. And the reason the tension has increased is because the United States had got so used to telling the Russians what to do during the last years of Gorbachev and most of the years that the country was ruled by Yeltsin that they are extremely angry with Putin for asserting Russian sovereignty. If Putin was doing what he what the Americans wanted him to do, they'd be happy. They wouldn't care about all these things regarding surveillance or hacking, but he's not. He has his own agenda. He defends what he regards as the interests of the Russian state before the, uh, the interests of the US state. That has been the case with the Russians for a long time. So every tiny thing the Russians do is blown up into something extraordinary, like the Russians are carrying out military maneuvers. This is an act of aggression against us. But NATO carries out military maneuvers on Russia's borders once a year, if not more than that. That's fine then. So once again, we, we, we see a world of double standards. And it's these double standards and the lack of any norms that make the world a more uh, a dangerous uh, place today. It doesn't mean that war is going to break out any minute between the United States and Korea, leave alone the United States and Russia, but it creates an unease, which is why, as many leaders of Europe once suggested at the time of the first Cold War, it would be beneficial for the world if the European powers acted independently, that would give them far more prestige in helping to deal with crises abroad.